Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out on a Saturday. Can you still see me behind here? <laughs> so, first of all, I promise I'm not trying to scare you with this. I promise. It's going to sound a little bit scary, but just keep in mind, only about 20% of patients on immunotherapy have significant side effects other than some minimal fatigue. So just keep that in mind as we're going through this. So, in general, um, it's, it's been difficult to treat cancer because our immune system recognizes cancer as our self. Cancer cells, hold on, let me pull this up. Is that better? Perfect, thank you. So in general, cancer cells are our own cells, which makes it difficult for the immune system to be able to recognize it and then attack it, which is, has been a problem going on. So with immunotherapy, our purpose is to try to amp up the immune system to be able to allow it to recognize those cancer cells and to attack it itself. So that's kind of the general basis of immunotherapy. So essentially, as I said, cancer escapes the immune re response because our immune system recognizes it as our own self. <clears throat> if we amp up the immune system, there's a higher chance that our immune system will be able to find that cancer cell and be able to attack it. Now what we'll be focusing more on today is if the immune response is activated a little bit too much and attacks other things that really we don't want it to. In response to that, we have a very general uh, way of managing that with steroids usually to help bring down the immune system to a more, um, a more approachable level. So the immune system, it can be a little bit finicky. It can technically attack anything and everything that it wants. Um, as I said before, only about 20% of patients on immunotherapy would develop some type of side effect other than um, generalized fatigue, things like that. And even a lesser percentage, about half of those patients would have a more significant side effect that required um, significant um, management of them. So as you can see here, there's multiple systems that can be affected such as the respiratory system, or your lungs, the GI tract, specifically the colon. The skin is one more common side effect that we do see, some itchiness and rash. Uh, very rarely, it can also affect the liver, the kidneys. Um, a little bit more commonly, we also see the endocrine system with the thyroid. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Very rarely, it can attack the heart and also the nervous system, as well as the eyes. So first, we're going to talk about the lungs a little bit. As I said, the immune system can technically attack anything that it wants by mistake. Um, and in the lungs, this would present as what we call pneumonitis or an inflammation of the lungs. This would be presented by difficulty breathing all of a sudden, cough, fever, chest pains, things along those natures. Now, a lot of our patients already have some underlying lung disorders. So what we generally advise is any type of change with their shortness of breath, if they have any underlying, any type of change with their cough, things like that. And over, over all of the side effects I'll be going over, the main thing, the most important thing to take away from this is to really communicate with your providers very well if you're on this immunotherapy agent. Um, regarding your symptoms. If there's anything changing, anything funny, it's important for us to, for you to let us know. Um, you know, I'd personally rather get way too many calls and everything be okay than to not have enough calls and something be seriously wrong. So with pneumonitis, typically how we treat this is we hold the medication for a certain amount of time. Um, it can present as the symptoms I discussed, or sometimes it can be asymptomatic, meaning that you don't you don't personally feel anything going on, but we can see it on the CT imaging. As you can see up here, you see this fluffiness on the image to the right, whereas the image to the left is a normal, healthy lung. The way we would treat this, as I discussed, would be to hold the immunotherapy treatment and to treat with oral steroids. The GI tract 
Um, very similarly, the immune system can attack, uh, specifically the colon, causing what we call colitis. The symptoms can include diarrhea. Now, diarrhea can be a common complaint, so it's important to differentiate normal diarrhea um, or dietary diarrhea versus significant immune-mediated diarrhea. Um, this will often present as a watery diarrhea, multiple episodes per day, meaning four, five, six, a big change from what you're used to. Um, and it will persist often for days without being helped by antidiarrheal such as Imodium or Lamotil. It can also present as some abdominal cramping or pain, fevers, some bleeding. You'll notice weight loss as well. This is also treated by holding the medication and treating with systemic steroids, usually oral first, but if it's severe enough, we would go to IV. Dermatitis, or the skin inflammation, as I discussed, this is one of the more common symptoms we see. Um, generally, it can present as itchiness. Um, funny enough, there doesn't always have to be a rash along with the itchiness. So if you're itchy for no reason, if you don't see any rash on your skin, it's still important for you to let us know because you can use creams and things like that to help out with that. Um, it can present as, I said, itchiness. You can have a rash with that. I think there's, yes, there's a lovely picture right there of how that can look. Um, you can also have an increased sensitivity to the sun, meaning that you know, you'll develop a rash if you're out in the sun um, exposed a little bit longer than um, than what you would normally see with a, um, with a sun exposure. Very rarely we can see something significant like a toxic epidermal necrolysis, which essentially is a very fancy term for a very bad breakdown of the skin due to an immune-mediated response. And this, we generally treat, if it's mild, you can use an over-the-counter corticosteroid cream like cortisone 10, something like that. Even a Benadryl cream will help the itchiness. If it's significant and not helped with that, then we can do prescription steroid creams. If it's more significant and still not helped, we go to oral steroids. And if it's covering enough of your body and it's really not tolerable, we would also hold the medication for a certain amount of time until it gets better. So liver events, these are extremely rare, but can occur. You yourself probably would not notice too many symptoms. We generally follow this with your lab work each time we see you, which is at least once a month. Um, you could present with jaundice, meaning a yellowing of the eyes. This isn't common. Your bilirubin, one of the liver functions that we look at in the lab work, would have to be very elevated for this to be so, but it's something we look for. Um, extreme fatigue. Some joint pains can be associated with that, fever, and sometimes some abdominal pain as well. But mainly, the lab work with the liver enzymes is what we look for with this. Another extremely rare side effect would be it affecting the kidneys. Um, this would present as, even if you're having a little bit of an issue going to the bathroom with urination, sometimes you wouldn't have anything to urinate for an extended period of time. This more so we would check on lab work as well. You can also have some swelling in your, your legs particularly, but more so we would follow this with uh, lab work. One thing we do see somewhat commonly out of these at least is an effect to the endocrine system. As I said, it can manifest as a hypothyroidism, meaning that it will attack the thyroid gland and cause it to burn out essentially, so it's not able to produce those normal hormones. We follow this in lab work each time we see you as well. And this is one that has a pretty easy treatment regimen to manage this. Um, it should not affect your treatment regimen with immunotherapy, and we're able to give you something called Synthroid, if you're familiar with that, to help replace those thyroid hormones. Symptoms can include new headaches, um, very, very fatigued, sometimes weight gain, um, changes in mood and behavior such as depression-like symptoms and things like that. These are pictures of the pituitary gland specifically. Um, another 
area of the endocrine system that it can affect is the pituitary gland and ca causing what we call hypophysitis. Essentially, what that means is an inflammation of the pituitary gland. This affects more of the natural uh, steroids that are produced in your body. And with this, we would replace that with daily steroids. And we would also set you up immediately to see our endocrine team, which we work very closely with. Carditis is another extremely rare possibility, but worth noting because it's a, an extremely dangerous possibility. Myocarditis, or an inflammation of the musculature of the heart, can present um, usually as chest pain or arrhythmias, meaning that you have palpitations, things like that, or we would see irregularities on an EKG. <laughs> And this is another we would stop the medication most likely permanently for you. Up here we see um, an MRI image of the heart, the top images, and we see what the arrows are pointing to is essentially a thickening of the musculature there. Another very rare event that can occur is neurological effects. I've only seen this twice out of our patients, um, many of which are treated with immunotherapy, but it, it can occur, but it's extremely rare. This would oftentimes present as extreme weakness, especially in the legs, arms, um, vision disorders, dysarthria, meaning trouble speaking, um, trouble word finding, trouble making, um, making the words from your mouth, um, seizures, headache, dizziness, this would be a very big shock usually to you, and you would notice this. Sometimes it can occur very slowly, meaning that one day you're more fatigued, you're noticing some weakness in your legs, you're not able to walk or do as much as what you're used to be doing, and over the course of a few weeks, it becomes much more prominent. And this is another that we would likely discontinue medication permanently for. Uveitis is something specific to the eyes. It would be an inflammation um, of the eyes caused by the immune event. This can occur, um, and you would have some symptoms such as blurry vision, irritated eyes, sometimes red and itchy. And sometimes you can have something called Graves ophthalmology, ophthalmopolo, uh, ophthalmopolo, uh, I'm just going to skip that today. I need a little bit more coffee. But essentially, What's happening is the eyes are becoming very large, enlarged, and kind of poking out of your face. This would, again, be very noticeable. All right, so that concludes the immunotherapy. Just for a show of hands, can I see how many people here have been on any type of immunotherapy? All right, so we have a few. Excellent. So, <laughs> yeah, you specifically were on a very uh, interesting type. This was she was on a uh, anti um, an, an oncolytic type of virus that we injected directly into the lesions. You are special because um, I did not put that on here because we ha don't have a lot of patients that have been on it. But very interesting. Um, so now we'll go on to targeted therapy. Um, this is specific for our patients who have a BRAF-positive mutation. Um, we use two drugs, typically, dibrafenib and trametinib, um, which was uh, initially approved in January of 2014 for the treatment of metastatic disease. Much more recently, as of April of this year, it's now approved for uh, stage 3, meaning that it's now approved to prevent the recurrence of the cancer. So some side effects that we can see, and some are more common, are fever and chills, fatigue, and a rash, as well as sometimes nausea. Um, these would be the most common ones that we would see and deal with, especially when starting a patient on this medication. But there can also be diarrhea, uh, muscle aches and pains, abdominal pains, cough, headache, um, and so on and so forth. Right, so the BRAF inhibitors, particularly, uh, there's two drugs that I mentioned here, which are both approved by the FDA. Most common side effects are skin, as well as the fever that I had mentioned previously. Um, 
there is potential for photosensitivity or significant sensitivity to the sun exposure as well as one one interesting side effect of the BRF inhibitors is the development of new types of skin cancer which are squamous cell in origin so different than melanoma and often very easy to handle and very um, non-aggressive but that that is an interesting side effect of this drug that these these new lesions can pop up so frequent dermatologic examinations um, are very important especially on this drug um, and this also has some side effects of the eyes with potential uveitis, what we went over before. The liver, so we're watching the liver enzymes each time as well. And some general side effects, such as some, some hair thinning and loss. That's not, um, that's not very common, but it's possible. Some joint aches and pains, nausea, and fatigue, as I mentioned. One other one is a cardiac possibility. A QTC prolongation is something very specific that we see on an EKG imaging. When they hook you up to these monitors and look at the electrophysiology of your heart and how that's moving. Um, so we would monitor that as well. So this goes in a little bit more detail with the actual management. Uh, the dermatologic, as I said, um, it would require skin exams. We do this... Um, you know, frequently when we see you in office as well, but it's very important to see dermatology as well for that full skin examination. Um, decreasing sun exposure is always important um, with the diagnosis in general, but also for this medication. Uh, the ocular symptoms, we will ask you at each visit if there's any change in your vision, anything that you've noticed, and we recommend frequent um, I guess not too frequent, but you know, regular follow-ups with the ophthalmologist. If you do develop some of these symptoms, steroid eye drops can be applied. The <laughs> cardiac, as I mentioned, that would be seen more on the EKG. So we would obtain an EKG at baseline and then um, follow that pretty closely until we are comfortable that you will not have any changes that way. If we do notice that, we would hold until it went back to normal, hold the drug, I mean, until the EKG went back to normal and then resume at a grade, um, at a reduced dose as long as it went back to a, a relatively normal level. The hepatic or the liver functions, as I said, we monitor your liver function tests and move forward that way. Um, and the general nausea can be helped by antiemetics, um, arthralgias, meaning the joint and muscle aches and pains can be helped by NSAIDs like, um, like Tylenol, ibuprofen, things like that. And as well as fevers can be handled in that general manner with, with Tylenol or ibuprofen. The MEK inhibitors, uh, one drug that I put on there, trametinib, we use in combination with the BRAF inhibitors. This is because the two together have been shown to provide an, a better response rate than either of them alone. The side effects are very similar to the BRAF inhibitors, but also include some ocular symptoms, uh, the cardiac symptom, which is a little bit different than the EKG. It would um, have to do with the musculature itself as well. And in general, it can cause some edema or some swelling of your ankles. So the management is very similar. The ocular we went over, the dermatologic we went over, uh, liver functions we monitor in blood work each time we see you. Uh, the hematologic we monitor in blood work each time we see you as well and make sure that there's no bad effect on the white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, anything that way. Uh, the cardiac, since it's a little bit different than the BRAF, we would handle this a little bit differently. Um, we would monitor you with an echocardiogram or an ultrasound of the heart to make sure the musculature wasn't being affected poorly. And the general, as I said before, diarrhea can be managed with antidiarrheals, nausea with medication like, um, like Zofran and Compazine. Um, and if any of these are significant enough, we would hold the drug or discontinue completely and talk about something else. Right, and questions will be held until the end, but I just want to put as a final word, it's overall symptom management, communication is the most important part. You know, if, and anybody who's met me knows I ask a million and one questions when I get you back into the room, we go over a full list, but it's really important that if anything's going on, especially in between our visits, 
that good communication and letting us know is the first and most important part of that. All right, thank you.